All right, uh, let's get started for chapter 7. Okay, I mentioned last time, after chapter 6, the content for organic chemistry is done. And chapter 7 through 12, we're going to study a brief view of biochemistry. Okay, biochemistry. So basically, if you ask me, well, what is Chem 102? Chem 102 is basically a first few chapters of organic chemistry, which is a one-year class, and a first few chapters of biochemistry, which is another one-year of class for science. So, so you guys are basically studying two courses in a, in a superficial way, fundamental way, in one semester course. Okay, the first six chapters of biochemistry mainly will deal with the major types of biomolecules and also including enzymes. And uh, theoretically, uh, we're supposed to study the metabolism of these biomolecules, but we don't have time for the semester. So those are kind of left behind. Remaining part, if you ask me what part of biochemistry we haven't started, the, the part that we haven't started is the transformation or the metabolism, we call that, in the body of these biomolecules. But we will spend the rest of the, the first six chapters to, to learn these biomolecules and what are, the, what, what are they and how they're important, how they're involved in the biological activities of our, of our human system. Okay, so let's take a look of what is biochemistry and what are the biomolecules in general, then we go over and move over to chapter seven. Okay, so this table listed these biochemical substances in the living system, mostly in, in human. As you can see that, of course, Around 75, uh, 65 to 70 percent of our body weight is water. Okay, we're, 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 we're body weight water, and that's inorganic compounds. But if we get out of water, if we get a dry body, okay, the most important and the major weight is these bioorganic substances. Okay, you can see that they add together close to 30 percent, less than 30 percent. But again, most of us water. If you get rid of water, the majority of our body weight is these bioorganic substances. And other than that, we do have around 5% of inorganic salts, mostly in our bones and teeth, etc. Okay, but the most important part of a living system are these bioorganic substances. Of course, they have different percentages. Doesn't mean they're Percentage related to importance, they're all important. They just exist in, in, in our body in different percentages, okay, including proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. So those are the four types of bioorganic molecules we're going to study in the first six chapters of biochemistry. Of course, two of those chapters we're gonna deal with the protein. You can see that 15% of our body weight is protein. Okay, we're, made, we're based on butyl proteins. We have two chapters studying protein molecules, right? And uh, this picture shows you these four types of bioorganic molecules. Okay, bioorganic molecules. As you can see, these four types, three of them, which also in your title picture, in the first picture of this, 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 this today's lecture, three of them, are called biomacromolecules. Okay, the word macro, M-A-C-R-O, means what? The large molecules. They're made by repeating units of building blocks. Okay, those three types are proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. Okay, macro means these molecules are relatively big in size, and they have small building blocks. And most times, the building class will repeat with themselves to form a large molecule. The other type, lipids, on the other hand, can compare these three types are smaller biomolecules. Okay, even though, of course, they're more complicated, complex than, than the ones we have seen in our first three, six chapters. The six, first six chapters, chapters, you only see like small, very simple structures. Okay, compared with the molecules I've seen before, lipids are still more, looks complicated, but 
lipids are considered as small organic, bio-organic molecules in our living system. These first three types are polymers, the large molecules, okay, the large molecules. And again, we'll study all these four types in the next few chapters, right? So in chapter seven, okay, in chapter seven, we're going to study carbohydrates, okay, carbohydrates. And I call this chapter the sweet chemistry. The reason carbohydrates has, an, has another name, okay, you guys know it's called sugars. Okay, carbohydrates are basically sugars. So carbohydrates are basically sugar chemistry. We know sugars are sweet. We're gonna talk about the relative sweetness of these carbohydrates as well in the, in the last part of this, this chapter. Now the picture shown here, Okay, picture showing here are the nine common sugar structures that are responsible for mammalian carbohydrates. It means us. Okay, our carbohydrates are mainly made by these nine sugars. Okay, some of you, you probably have heard of names. Some of you, most of them not. For example, the first one, glucose, you guys have probably heard of. But these are the nine basic carbohydrates that are responsible for mammalian cell carbohydrates. Of course, bacteria, their structures are a lot more diversified. Okay, but for us, we're made by these nine common sugars. Okay, we will not name or, 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 or study each one of them, but I want to show you okay, these are the building blocks. And the bottom symbols, you can see different shapes, different colors are actually uh, internationally accepted symbols for these carbohydrates. The reason is like we told you, carbohydrates are what? big molecules. It's very difficult to show structure one at a time. Sometimes we just, we may use just a abbreviation of the name or use the symbols to show you a chain of carbohydrates, for example. And each symbol represents a small building block, right? So first is some important functions of carbohydrates, even though it only has 2% in our body weight, but it has a lot of important biological functions, okay, biological functions, such as provide energy during oxidations, okay, during oxidation. Basically, carbohydrates are the main nutritional source to provide the body energy, to provide our energy. And carbohydrates also provide the source of carbons for constructing our carbon-based materials in our body, in our, in our living system. Not only provide energy, but also provide what? Carbons. And also, okay, also, which is not very common or not that important compared with plants, carbohydrates are also a form of energy storage. Okay, but as animals, we don't have a lot of energy storages compared with plants, but carbohydrates are also a source of energy storage in living systems. And finally, okay, finally, as we know more about carbohydrates, the okay, carbohydrates branch of chemistry is a new branch of chemistry. As we knew more about the carbohydrates, we realized that not only carbohydrates are the old ways of people think they provide energy, provide carbon, but actually carbohydrates are a part of the structural elements on our cells and tissues. Okay, now this last function is actually relatively new in the, during the last 20, past 20 and 30 years. Okay, for example, okay, I wanna give you more info. I'm a carbohydrate chemistry, so I can show you more chemist. I will show you more about carbohydrates. Okay, this is a bacterial cell, not a human cell, but if you look, look, take a look at the cell surface, okay, take a look at the surface, it's very what? Hairy. Okay, that hairy structure is actually carbohydrates. If you, if you have a mini drone, if you fly an airplane, imagine like a tiny airplane, you can sit on it. If you fly over the surface of a cell, no matter bacterial cell or, or human cell, you will find like a forest structure. A lot of trees growing on the, on, on the surface of the cell. If you can fly over the cell surface. And those trees are again are what? Are carbohydrates. Okay. That is where most carbohydrates are located in our biologic system is where? On the surface of cells. Okay, if you can imagine, if, if, a, if a molecule is located on the surface of a cell, the molecule most likely is involved in what? Interaction with other 
external species. So this next picture shows you some of the most important functions of carbohydrates other than providing energies. Okay, other than energies. You can see that these tiny, remember I showed you those tiny shapes are carbohydrate chains. Those are the hairy high chains. The carbohydrates are responsible for interacting with everything, almost everything, contacting with ourselves, such as toxins, microorganisms, virus, enzymes, antibodies, hormones, receptors, carbohydrate binding proteins, everything that are responsible for communicating with ourselves, most of them are through what? The surface carbohydrates. The surface carbohydrates. Now this one still maybe give you a very abstract idea. I don't know what an interaction is. I'll give you two examples. Okay, one example is, you all know, our blood tape type. Right? You all know you have blood A, blood B, blood A, B, and blood O types. The ABO system blood type is actually determined by a group of carbohydrate on our red blood cell surface. Okay, this four carbohydrate unit, okay, this four carbohydrate unit is called an antigen. For people who have this four carbohydrate unit, a group of hydro unit, or we, we call that a liposaccharide. Those people are called blood O type person. Okay, blood O type. Now, if some, another group of people, if they have an extra gene on top of these four carbohydrate units, they transfer one extra more a different carbohydrates, which is called in galactosamine. If you have one more, then your blood a type. Another group of person, instead of transferring this sugar, if they transfer another galactose on the on the O type person, then you are what? Blood B type. And blood A B type means what? On um, those persons on their red blood cells, you have both this group and that group. That's called a blood A B type. Of course, they're again they're on the cell surface, they're antigens. So in different blood type sugar, their bloodstreams have different antibodies for these carbohydrates. So if you can read more, of course. Blood type is basically the type of blood determining carbohydrates on your, our, our, our red blood surfaces. Okay, this is one example. Another example is related to us during the past few years is the Infection of chlorara, chloravirus. Okay, the, the, the name of the chloravirus is the SARS uh, cov virus dash, uh, dash two. This is the name of the virus. Okay. When they infect with infected with our cell surface, okay, they will bind to a protein, of course. But in order for the virus to fuse with our cells, they have to pass a very heavy dense of carbohydrates attached on the surface, surface surface. And the name of those carbohydrates, many are called heparin sulfate. Okay, very heavy dense in order for the virus to pass the surface. So in order for a virus to infect a human cell, okay, you need two things. One is the binding protein. Okay, now the one is the interaction with the carbohydrates. That's true for a lot of viruses, including flu virus, herpes virus. If they wanted to infect our human cells. They either have to bind with the carbohydrates on the cell surface or have to pass through with a lot of interactions with our carbohydrates. Okay, this is the picture showing a, a high resolution of, of, of electro, electron microscope showing the infection of, of viruses. This is a real picture. The, the orange red dots are COVID viruses. Okay, this is a heavy infected patient cell okay, by, by COVID virus. So, Again, I want to give you those examples, and there's, there's a lot more. Like I said, the most common seen virus, flu viruses, if they want to interact with our certain human cells, they have to bind it with a certain carbohydrates on the tip of the tree, on the top of, of the hairy surface, okay, in order to bind our, our human cell before they can infect with the human cell. Okay, again, as people know, study these biochemistries, they understand more and more about the function of different carbohydrates on the surface, even though, again, carbohydrates only has 2% of our body weight.
but they are responsible for a lot of biochemical interactions between cell and cells and cell with the external environment. Okay, so that's all the background. Let's take a look at what are carbohydrates and what are the structure of them and how do these small carbohydrates building blocks make a large polymer unit. Okay, let's learn all the chemistry and all the terms of carbohydrates. First, carbohydrates are defined as aldehydes or ketones with multiple hydroxy groups. Okay, multiple hydroxyl groups. So that's what we call them polyhydroxy aldehydes or ketones. So this info tells you what? Carbohydrates are either what? Aldehyde or ketones. And meanwhile, in their structures, they have many hydroxyl groups. Okay, hydroxyl groups. And like we said, mentioned earlier before, carbohydrates are large molecules. Okay, large molecules. So any large molecules that can hydrolyze to give these polyhydroxy aldehyde ketones are also classified as hard carbohydrates. We also classify that. This picture shows you two, okay, two building blocks, two small carbohydrates. We call them monosaccharides. We see that word right away. One is an aldehyde, another one is a ketone. If you take a look at the structure, we said on chapter four, aldehyde, we abbreviate the functional group into what? CHO. We know the CO has a what? Double bond. Okay, there's a hydrogen on it. So that's why we use CHO. Okay, this is the structure of glucose, our blood sugar. Okay, glucose. Here on the right is a ketone. You can see that this carbon has two carbons bonded to it. It's a ketone. This CO double bond is internal, not at the, at the end. So why? that's why it's a ketone. And this name of the sugar is called fructose. Okay, you know fructose be, because of the name. It came from what? From fruits, all types of fruits. You eat a, the, the reason Grapes, for example, taste so good, taste so sweet, is because of fructose. Okay, but you can see that both structures, they have what? A lot of hydroxy groups. Okay, so that's what a carbohydrate looks like. And by the way, okay, you might wonder, where does the name carbohydrate, this name, came from? Okay, originally, when people study carbohydrates, they found Many carbohydrates, their molecular formula, that means don't look at the structure. If you, if you look at this, the formula, you'll find out, for example, glucose and fructose, both, they have the same formula, C6H12O6. And they will notice that the ratio of H and O is actually what? Two to one, you see that? So you can change that formula into C6H2O6. Do you guys see that? Why? Because the H and O, the, the, the ratio is what? Two to one. Do you guys see that? So six times two is 12, six times one is six. So what do you see here? In the formula of carbohydrates, such as glucose and fructose, the glucose and fructose, what we see is they have some carbon and a what? Some water, is that right? Again, no water here, but when we people know the, the formula, they found out, hey, the carbohydrates, it sounds like the molecule has some carbon and what? Different numbers water in it, because what? Hydrogen oxygen ratio is what? Two to one. Water is H2O, right? That's why people name these molecules carbohydrates. Carbo stands for what? Carbon. Hydrate stands for what? Water. That's how they name those molecules. Of course, later on, people found out the ratio of carbon to hydrogen and oxygen is not always two to one, but we start keeping using this name, carbohydrates. And that's why you guys wonder what, where the name came from, from the formula. Okay. The poor people know, we even know about the structure. And also glucose and fructose are isomers. You can see that they're both C6H12O6. Right, so that's some side story about the, the name. Now, because Carbohydrates are larger molecules. So based on the size, we classify carbohydrates into different types. Okay, different, different types. If a carbohydrate contains only one single unit, like a building block, like the one we have just seen previously, like glucose and fructose, we call those monosaccharides. Okay, monosaccharides. Mono means what? 
single unit. Saccharide is a, another word of carbohydrates. They mean the same thing, okay, monosaccharides. If you have two molecules of monosaccharides chemically bonded together, okay, we'll study in this chapter as well how, how, what is the bond looks like and how do they bond together. And we call it a disaccharide. Okay, disaccharide. If a few carbohydrates bonded together, it doesn't have to be linear. Okay, later on, we're going to see carbohydrates are actually branched. Okay, a few of them, normally between three and nine. Okay, normally between number three and nine. We call those oligosaccharide. Okay, oligosaccharide. And the blood sugar, remember, as I showed you earlier, that the blood type determining sugar is an oligos oligosaccharide. And of course, if you have a large molecule of the polymer, okay, like a thousands of carbohydrates bonded together, we call it a polysaccharide. Okay, polysaccharide. You can see they have the same suffix, saccharide, but depends on the number of units. We have mono, di, oligo, and polysaccharide. So is an oligosaccharide three to nine? Yes, three to nine, normally three to nine. A 10, I mean, it's hard to tell. There's really no cutoff lines. I mean, if oligosaccharide mostly is less than 10, if more than that, you can either call it either way. There's nobody call it wrong. But in general, polysaccharides are much bigger than 10, 20. Okay? There's no like a 20 units carbohydrates or not. Usually either you have a small group oligosaccharide or a large polysaccharide. Okay? So again, there's no cut of like the, the numbering wise. Okay? Normally it's less than 10, we call it oligosaccharide. More than that, we call them polysaccharide. Okay, next. In order to study monosaccharide, the structure of those polyhydroxy L hydroketones. Okay, we, we, before we study the structures, we first need to take a look at a new type of isomer. You know, because that's very common in carbohydrate structures. Once you know that the, 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 that type of isomer, you will see that a lot of carbohydrate structures are related because of the isomerism. So let's review this concept we have been studying for the past few chapters. First is what is an isomer? What we studied in chapter one, what is an isomer? What are isomers? Isomers are what? Same molecular formulas, but different structures. Okay, very simple, if they have the same C something, H something, O something, N something, doesn't matter. But their structures are what? Different. That's all isomers are defined in that. But while we study different chapters, we have seen different types of isomers. The most commonly seen isomers are the one we have studied in chapter one. That is what? That is the attachment of the carbons are different. Okay, for example, shown here, this molecule has what? Five carbons. We call that pentane. The longest chain is five. But I break a bond attached to somewhere, I make a four carbon chain with a group. Of course, this is called two methyl butane, but both have what? Five carbons. We call this type of isomer because the attachment is different. Okay, one is longest chain, five. This one longer chain is what? It's four. We call this type of isomer Structure. constitutional isomer or what? Structural isomer. And by the name, you can, you can tell what? The reason we call them constitutional or structural is because their attachment of carbon is what? Different. It's different. Their backbone is totally different. And then in chapter one and two, we also have seen this type of isomer in which the attachment is the same, but the spatial orientation of some groups are different, right? For example, the cis and trans. In this case, the longest chain is four. The double bond is between what? Two and three. In this case, the longest chain is four. Double bond is between what? Two and three. You can see the attachment is the same. But in this molecule, these two methyl are on what? Same on the same side. This on, on what? Opposite. On the opposite side. And we call this type of isomer geometric isomer. Geometric isomer. And 
this type of isomer because the attachment is the same, but different in orientation. It belongs to a group of isomer called a sterile isomer. These steroids. This is the one type of sterile isomer, which is different from constitutional. Again, because of what? The attachment is the same. The attachment is the same. The only difference between the pairs of molecules is the spatial orientation is different. And today, in order to study the structure of carbohydrates, we're going to take a look at another type of stereoisomers in which the attachment is the same. But in a three-dimensional view, they are different. And we call this, this type of isomer in Chapter 7 optical isomers. The optical isomers. Okay, what are optical isomers? Let's take a look at our two hands. Okay, imagine our two hands are the same. No, 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 don't worry about the, the, some cracks or some of your nails are different. We assume our left our hand or right hand are the same. And the same is quoted. What I mean the same is your left hand and your right hand are basically mirror images of another, right? If you think about it, I put a mirror. That's what you see in, in, in the mirror. No matter if you're left hand or right hand, if you're looking in the mirror, you see what? The other one. Is that right? So that's what we call their mirror images. If they're mirror images, means they're what? The attachment is the same. My thumb is here, my four fingers are here, my, both are attached, attached to my palm. But if you look at these two hands, even they're mirror images, but I cannot superimpose them. I cannot put a one on top of another. There no way you can, you can put like this, the still mirror image. But you cannot put these two what? Totally on top of another, we call that superimpose. If you cannot do that, it means these two are not the same object. They are optical isomers. They're not done the same thing. One is right hand and one is left hand. They cannot superimpose. And this type of isomers, we call that optical isomer. The optical isomer. Your left hand and right hand are what? Are a pair of optical isomers have the same attachment, have the same of everything, a palm five fingers, a palm five fingers. But three-dimensionally, you cannot superimpose them. That means they're different. They're two different objects. And we call those pair optical isomers. And because of this property, because my hands cannot be superimposed, we call this property chiral. Okay, it's a new word, chiral. What is chiral? Chiral means what? Means you have a non-superimposable mirror image. My left hand is chiral. My right hand is also what? Chiral. They're both chiral. They have one mirror images that cannot be superimposed to each other. And to give you a better idea of what superimpose this word means, the bottom two flasks will tell you what it means. These are flasks, and these are mirror images, but you can see that if, if they, can, they can pass through. These two, two flasks can be what? Can be superimposed to another. You, you, can, you, can, you can stack them to one, one on top of another to make a same object. If that's the case, the flasks are not chiral. And those two flags are mean what? They're the same. They're not isomers. Your hands are chiral because of what? They're isomers. You guys see that, the difference? Okay, that's the best way of understanding what are optical isomers. Okay. They cannot be superimposed with their mirror image. Okay, with their mirror image. Now, of course, these are hands. Okay, those are hands, not molecules. Let's take a look at these. Monarchies. Okay, those are you sum your, your 3D imagination. Take a look at the monarchy on the left. Okay, it has a mirror image on the other side, but if you try to superimpose them, you will find out two atoms in this case. The chlorine and bromine cannot be superimposed. Take a look. What, the, what this picture does is they lift the molecule and try to superimpose it over the top. Okay, see that? 
They can use some 3D magic. This one, the, the bromine is pointing in. This one, the chlorine is pointing in. So if you want to superimpose, you will see that the bromine will be superimposed with, with the chlorine, and the chlorine will be superimposed with the bromine. That makes what? Makes these two molecules non-superimposable. You guys see that? Of course, these two you can. These three atoms you can superimpose, but those two you cannot. And the same with the molecules on the right. I'll give you a couple minutes and try to use your, try your best to use your special orientation. And the worst things, if you cannot, that's fine. It's not a requirement for this class. The requirement for this class is only you understand what these are. These are non-superimposable mirror images. And these are isomers. And we call these molecules, again, what's that word? Chiron. Okay, chiron. That's a property. What is chiron? Chiron means you have a mirror image that cannot be what? Superimposed. Okay, these both are not superimposable mirror images. You can try your best. It is not a requirement for this class. If you still cannot see it, that, that is fine. Maybe you build a model who can help you see better. Okay, now, take a look at this picture. I, I, I put two pairs in comparison. Hope you can see something different. The top two molecules are mirror images to each other, but they cannot be superimposed. You can try it. Okay, you can try it. I'll, I'll point out later. The bottom two molecules, very similar with some difference. They are mirror images, but they can be superimposed. If they can be superimposed, means what? They're not isomers. So take a look at the top, top and bottom, see what is the difference. And then we're gonna bring out something important. How do we tell? I cannot bring, I cannot put a mirror in my pocket all the time. Okay, how can we tell? whether a molecule is chiral or not. Okay, it was a simple way, how can we tell, but can you tell the difference between the top? Why these two are chiral? Why these are not chiral? What's the difference between the top case and the bottom case? I think it's the rotation, when you rotate it, then uh, in the, the first one, it, yeah, it cannot be superimposed, but in the second one, when you rotate it, can be superimposed. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, yes, from the view it is. But what's the difference between the structure of these pot top and bottom? The bottom one has two of the same. So two the chlorine. bottom one, this carbon, has two what? Identical chlorines. That solved the problem when you repeat it. You don't worry about these two chlorines. They can always superimpose. Why? Because they're what? Same. They're the same. Is that right? Why the top one you cannot superimpose? Because when you rotate it, the chlorine originally is pointing out. It would, after you rotate, it will point what? Pointing in, which will superimpose the bromine. That's why you cannot superimpose, because these two are what? Different. Okay, different. So that's the key. How do we know something is chiral or not? Is whether a carbon is bonded to four different groups. Remember we said earlier in chapter one, carbon has how many bonds? Four. four. If those four are bonded to four different groups, then that carbon will be a chiral carbon. Does this make sense? You see that the top and bottom example? The top one carbon has four what? Different, I don't even care what they are, hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, as long as they're four different then you will be chiral. The bottom one, it does not have four different groups because you have two identical one, chlorine. Then the bottom carbon is not chiral. You can see that these two molecules can be superimposed. So here is something you need to know, not the mirror. Okay? If you cannot imagine, it's okay. A lot of people, even after studying organic chemistry, cannot imagine. That's fine. 
because the, for more complex molecules, we cannot even use mirror that, that way. But an organic molecule that contains a carbon attached to four different groups will be chiral. And what does it mean will be chiral? means it will have what? Two non-superimposable what? Mirror images. Does it make sense, guys? All four bonds should be different. All four groups. The bonds are the same. All four groups yeah. attached to the carbon must be what? Different. Must be different. Take a look at this guy. This is the carbon. If we look at it. All four groups attached to the carbon is what? Are different. That means those two mirror images will not superimpose. Does it make sense, guys? Four different groups, no matter atoms or groups, as long as there's four are different. And the carbon with four different groups attached is called a chiral carbon or a chiral center. That is a chiral seven. A chiral carbon or a chiral seven. Make sure you digest this. I put in red. Okay, digest this guideline. How do we know a carbon or a molecule is chiral? How do we know it has isomers? Here's the guideline. And because of this guideline, there are two like implications to something to help you better understand this guideline. That is first. A carbon atom involved in a multiple bond, such as double bond or triple bond, cannot be chiral. Why? Because it will no longer have what? Four different groups. We're not counting four different bonds now. We're counting four what? Groups. If you have a multiple bond, there's no way you can have four different groups. Owning sp3 carbon ha can have what? Chiral. Four different groups. Does it make sense, guys? If you have double or triple bond, you can have four bonds, that's fine. But you cannot have what? Four different groups. So carbon involved in multiple bonds, double or triple bonds, cannot be chiral carbon. Another implication easier is a carbon with two identical groups can what? Not Cannot be chiral carbon. Does it make sense? You have to have four different, of course, you have two identical groups. So take a look at the top molecule. Okay, take a look at the molecule. How many carbon do you see here? One, two. Three. How many carbons do you see? Three carbons. Three carbons. But take a look at these three carbons. Why only this guy is chiral? It tells you by these two implications. This carbon has two identical what? Hydrogens. Hydrogen, that means what? It cannot this carbon is not chiral. Is that right? Mm -hmm. This carbon is what carbon? What carbon? Take a look at the group. CHO is what? Aldehyde. Aldehyde, what is aldehyde? The CHO is what? Double bond. Double bond. A carbon involved in <coughs> multiple bond can not be chiral. You guys see that? That is why in this molecule with only three, this is a carbohydrate by the way, with only one hydroxy, but it's a carbohydrate. This carbohydrate with only three carbons, only which one is chiral? That one is chiral. Okay, you can tell. Okay, you can tell. Okay, you will, I will ask you to tell me okay, in real practice quizzes and tests. We good, everyone? Understand? I promise you, it's easier than the previous chapters. Okay, in the next few chapters, you don't have to draw a lot of structures. Okay, you need to take a look at these structures. You have to recognize them and what they tell what the, the structure tells you. Okay, this picture, give you a couple minutes. I circle some already. Each one has a chiral carbon, and that chiral carbon is denoted with a star set, sign, symbol. And see if you can understand why we specify that carbon chiral.
The other carbons are not chiral. No matter how many carbons they had, these three molecules, only one chiral carbon. Give you a couple minutes. You guys all see it? If not, ask me. Okay, you have to know. Okay, we'll ask you questions like this. Can you put a star on the chiral carbon? For example, give you molecules randomly. Can you put a star on the chiral carbon? You have to be able to based on what we learned. Okay, again, star is usually used to specify chiral carbons in organic chemistry. Do you guys all see that? The chiral carbon? Why is chiral? I even circled that for you, of course. Next, organic compounds, especially the one we're gonna learn today, carbohydrates, they can have multiple chiral carbons or multiple chiral centers. And later on, I'm gonna show you what the number of chiral carbons can, can tell us. But a molecule does not have to only contain one chiral carbon. They can have multiple chiral carbons. For example, the two molecules, one I draw it horizontally, one I draw it vertically, the, the same, no matter how we draw it. The chiral carbons are two. noted with stars. Can you see them? <clears throat> if I give you a molecule like this, can you label the chiral carbons? And can you tell why the carbons that are not labeled, not chiral? Again, this is required technique you need to know from this chapter. If this carbohydrate has four chiral carbons, that one has two chiral carbons. Can you tell or can I, can you specify why each carbon is chiral? Why that's not chiral? Yes? In the first one, um, the C with the double bond is not chiral. Not chiral? And then the other one two identical H's. Good, not chiral. So the middle ones are what? Chiral. chiral. Why it's chiral? Because each one has what? Again, four different groups. Can you tell what are these four? OH, H, whatever that is, and what? Whatever that group is. As long as, if you look at one carbon, your eyes are on one carbon. This carbon has what? Four different groups. This carbon has what? Four different groups. You have two chiral carbons. The same over here. Again, to save some time, I have this picture to show you the, the molecule on the right. Why the four carbons are chiral? Here, one, two, three, four. These four carbons are chiral. Take a look. Each group, each carbon with four different groups are put in the box to better serve you to see those four different groups. You guys see it? Four different groups. Again, that carbon is not chiral. That carbon is not chiral. Only the middle four carbons are chiral. And each picture shows you why each carbon is chiral. You guys got it? All right. Next. The number of chiral carbons has some very important info about structure like this to tell us that is based on the number of chiral carbons or chiral centers we can estimate the number of isomers possible for that particular structure by using a very simple math to powered by n. What is n? n is the number of chiral carbons. For example, this molecule has how many chiral carbons? Four. So two powered by four is 16. It means what? 
There are 16 isomers possible for this molecule. Of course, we have only one shown here, but there are possibly 16 there. We're going to show them later. Okay, I will show you all 16 of them when we study the structure of carbohydrates. Does it make sense? The number of chirocarbons can tell you how many isomers are possible. Of course, optical isomers are possible for a certain structure. Okay, next, about carbohydrates. There is a very important chirocarbon we are looking at in a carbohydrate structure. That carbon will determine the absolute configuration of a carbohydrate. Okay, so take a look. What is the absolute configuration? of carbohydrate. It is determined by the highest numbered chirocarbon. The highest numbered chirocarbon. I'll explain. In carbohydrates, usually we name or number the aldehyde or ketone group as priority. So the aldehyde or ketone group will be numbered smaller. If you have aldehyde, then the aldehyde group will be number one. Then the other carbon will be numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, depending on the carbons. Good? Ketone, for example, this is number, ketone is on this end, so we number this one number one, ketone will be number two. Again, this is the same as we did in numbering aldehyde or ketones. After you number the carbons of carbohydrates, then we look what? Take a look. The highest numbered what? Chirocarbon. So there are two things you need to be careful. The first thing is you have to look for a what? Chirocarbon. And then you find what? The highest numbered what? Chirocarbon. For example, here. Take a look at the bottom case. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about the top one later in, in a minute. Take a look at the bottom case. This guy is the one we've just seen. It has how many carbons? Six carbons. This carbon, number one, not chiral. This carbon, number six, not chiral. Only carbon two, three, four, five are what? Chiral. Then based on that, we look at which carbon? The highest numbered chiral carbon. You see that? This is a chiral carbon and also highest numbered what? Five. Again, you're looking at the highest numbered chiral carbon. You cannot look at this carbon. This is not chiral. You're looking at what? This carbon. This is a very important carbon in structure of carbohydrates. If the OH on the carbon points to the left, we call the carbohydrates L carbohydrates. L doesn't stand, stands for left. L stands for Lev levery, levery is a Greek letter, but not left. If the OH on that carbon points to the right, we call the carbohydrate D carbohydrate. D stands for right in Greek letter, or Greek letter, or what? Yeah, Greek letter. D stands for dextrous. Dexter, dextrous. Means right. D and L sugars are a pair of what? Take a look. Isomer. A pair of mesomers. They're a pair of what? Mirror image. Do you guys see that? Do you guys see the D and L? They're mirror image? Right? You have the, the lines and mirror. You can see that they're mirror images. Exact mirror images. Okay, very important about D and L carbohydrates. Okay, I'll tell you why it's important. Why we look and why we would care this one. Okay, now you understand how do we tell D and L? You can take a look. The bot the top four cases. Okay, it's super very easy to 
determine whether something is D or F. Again, we're looking at what? The highest numbered what? Chiral carbon. Chiral carbon. Not highest number of carbon, but highest number of what? Chiral carbon. Please don't forget. It's a very simple, like I said, the concept itself is, it should be very simple. If left is L, right is what? It's D, but you have to find out that carbon. Okay, this one is what? L, that is one, D, L, D. Okay, capital D, capital L, and normally in science literature you will find out that D, L is actually two or one fonts, like a size smaller than the regular font. That's how we use it. You can see that the, the capital D and L is smaller than, than a capital size. Okay, now, why we care about D or L? Here's why. Usually, in nature, okay, in nature, owning D or L isomers are found. Okay, some cases, for some molecules, either you only see D molecules or L. If both DLL are found in nature, if they both exist in nature, fine. But they don't exist together in the same biological system. For example, humans can only metabolize D isomers of monosaccharides. That means what? Carbohydrates that are building on us are almost all D sugars. You take L sugars, you don't metabolize them. You, they taste sweet, but you don't metabolize them. And they're normally very expensive, L, L sugars. Because D sugar dominates nature in nature. And also, of course, D sugars are common in our biology system. And not only that, later on we're going to study in chapter 11, our proteins are only made by L amino acids. D amino acids are not found in biological, in our biological system, in some bacteria, yes. Okay, that's why we care, why we study D or L, why we care about that carbon, because they don't exist, coexist in the same biological system. Does this make sense? Okay, that's almost all of these the isomers while we study them. Later on, again, I want to show you the structure of them, why the mirror images info is important. Okay, now, very briefly, okay, very briefly, when you have a pair of isomers, a pair of mirror images, okay, we, we actually give that mirror images pair because we call them enantiomers. What are enantiomers? Enantiomer is a pair of images, just like your hands are enantiomers. When you have a pair of enantiomers, like we said, they are mirror images, meaning they're what? They're different in a three-dimensional view. So when they interact with our biological in in receptors, for example, something in our biological system, which is also chiral. So when they interact, one may interact with your biological system, the other one may not. If they both can interact with their biological system, they may interact with some different places. If one enantiomer may interact with the receptor A, the other one may interact with, with another totally different receptor or they cannot even be uh, interact at, at, at all. Depends on the structure of the molecule. What does this tell us? Tells us enantiomers cannot be used together as a pair. And we learned that in a very, very hard lesson. Okay, this is the drug sold 
between 1957 and 1962 in the United States and also in Europe. And this is called thalidomide. thalidomide. It comes with a pair of isomers. Why we use those drugs? Because it's very efficiently stopped early pregnancy nausea in anti nausea sedative. That's why they're used between these five years, 1957, 1962. But during those five years, people didn't realize they're given a pair of enatomers. One of the isomer does have the, the, the ability to what? To, to reduce the nausea in, in early pregnancy, in the early, early pregnant woman. The other enatomer interact with somewhere else, with the fetus, causing severe birth defects. There's a lot of babies born in those five years with missing legs and arms, fingers. And you can see that this is the history of that drug. It, by 1957, uh, by, by 1953, drug was created in Germany, and then 1961, an Australia doctor wrote to Lancet, which is one of the top medical journals, that a sudden increase of deformed babies born in his hospital. And then, by 1968, the first compensation settlements were reached, and then, by 1998, this drug was reapproved for treatment with something else. Okay, this is the hard lesson we learned because of the isomers. Of course, nowadays, okay, nowadays, this is the FDA guideline. Requires chiral molecules be prepared as single entities. Means what? If you want to use a chiral isomer, you have to separate these two isomers and give as what? As a single isomer. You cannot use the other. Okay, over 50% of the world top selling drugs are single enantiomers. You have to prove you have a single isomer, or you have to prove the other isomer does not have severe side effects. Okay, one of the drugs you guys have taken before, do you guys know omeprazole? Omeprazole, omeprazole. No? Naxim? Have you guys taken Naxim? They have, they have a lot of like over-the-counter like piles of them in Costco, Walmart. Do you, have, do you guys know Naxim? No? Naxim is a single isomer of omeprazole. Omeprazole is cheaper because it's a pair of isomer. They're both given. The other isomer apparently FDA approved and no side effect. Naxim is more effective because Naxim is only what? Half of them. Naxim is the effective isomer. When Naxim is first came out, it's very expensive, 50, 50 bucks a bottle. Now the cost went down. When Naxim is first out, it's very expensive because it's a single isomer. Okay, that is uh, one of them close to you. Again, you can, you can take a look. The, the medicine ended with, what's that last one? Omi, omiprazole. This is the, the medicine, omiprazole. It's the same as Nexin. It's a protein, a protein palm inhibitor to cause, to, to reduce heartburn. It's very effective. You take only one pill per day. This is a pair of isomers given. Okay, it's cheaper than Nexium. Okay. But they're the same thing. Okay, there is. Questions? Okay, that's why we study isomers. Then let's take a look. How do we use what we study so far to take a look at the structure of carbohydrates? When you have a carbohydrate, especially a monosaccharide. Okay, we're gonna study the structures of monosaccharides now. When you have a structure of monosaccharides, you first need to ask or answer two questions. Okay, two questions. Is this monosaccharide an L-hydroketone? And how many carbons are in total? These are two questions to be answered when you have a monosaccharide. Okay, in these, 
in your order. I, I guess I put the, the first question in order. So let's take a How many carbohydrates in total? Well, tell you what type of sugar it is. If you have three carbons, we call the sugar a triose. Four carbons, tetros. Five carbons, pentose. Six carbons, hexose. Seven carbons, of course, heptose. You can see that O-S-E is a what? Is another suffix for carbohydrates. So we, we know that this is a monosaccharide because there's only one A single unit, a single polyhydroxy on the hydro or ketone. Yeah. Yes. That's first question, how many carbons? Another question is again, what? Whether your monosaccharide is what? An aldehyde or ketone. If it is an aldehyde, you put the prefix auto in front of these triose, tetros, pentose. If it's a ketone, you get a prefix what? Ketone. ketone. And by combining these two, you can define a carbohydrate, a monosaccharide. For example, this one on the left, aldehyde, six carbons, we call it the auto hexose. This one, five carbons, ketone, we call it keto pentose. Does it make sense, guys? Okay, two things before we move on. In nature, hexoses and pentoses are most common. We don't see a lot of uh, tetros or, or triose. Okay, pentoses and hexoses. Hexoses is most common. Pentoses and hexoses are most commonly seen. Between aldos or and ketos, aldos are more common. So what are the most commonly seen carbohydrates? Aldo, hexose, and aldopentose are the most commonly seen carbohydrates. Good, guys? When you see a carbohydrate, it's very easy, right? How many carbons in total? And then what? Whether an aldehyde or what? Ketone. Ketone. You can define what this carbohydrate is. Anything structure you can define. Just answer these two questions. Okay, now after we know that, let's take a look at aldoses. Aldoses. Again, aldose is what? An aldehyde, right? Mm -hmm. If you have three carbons, we call those triose. If you imagine the structure of triose, the first carbon is what? Aldehyde. The second carbon, that last carbon is what? CH2. Is that right? Remember all carbon, carbon last carbon is CH2. So that means what? Total of three carbons for triose. We only have how many chiral carbons? One. One, I mean the middle one. Number two carbon is chiral. If we have one chiral carbons, how many isomers? Two. two isomers. One D, one L. Is that right? Remember, point left is what? L. Point D is what? Right is what? Is D. You have two isomers. One D, one L. Let's move on to aldo tetros. Four carbon in total. The top one, the last one is not chiral. So how many chiral carbons? Two. Two chiral carbons. Four isomers, two powered by two is what? Four, two D, two L. Out of pentose, three, is three chirocarbons, eight isomers, four D, four L. And out of hexose, four chirocarbons, like we mentioned earlier, there are what? 16 isomers, eight will be D, eight L. Okay, take a look. This picture shows you all the D aldoses. The D aldoses means what? What does mean D? Guys, take a look. They are all D aldoses means what? The highest number of chiral carbon has an OH point to where? To the right. You can see all OH with the red one points to where? To the right. They're all Ds means what? How do we know the L? I put a big mirror in front of the picture, you get what? You get the L sugars. 
8D, 8L, if you have a mirror here. 4D, 4L, 2D, 2L, 1D, 1, 1L. We didn't show L here because what? You can put a mirror. These are all the L doses. And of course, each one has a name. You, I won't ask you to name them. Does it make sense, guys? Good here. Next, Hedos is a little different. Okay, Hedos is a little different. Because keto group is on number two carbon. Okay, keto group is on number four carbon, which will make the number of chirocarbons one less than the corresponding aldose. Okay, for example, this guy has three carbons. You can take a look. All those three carbons are what? non chiro is that right? This is what? one? CH2, that is what? CH2, and the middle one is a ketone, it's not chiro. So it means what? Compared to trials of aldose, the chiro carbon here is what? Zero. Aldose has one chiro carbon. The same here. Keto tetros. Compared to aldose, aldose has how many chiro carbons? Two. Ketose only has how many? One. So we can see that the ketoses will have one less chirocarbon than the corresponding what? Aldose. Corresponding means what? The aldose of the same number of carbons in total. Of course, if they have one less chirocarbon, what does that tell you about the isomers? The number of isomers will be what? Half of the aldose. So here, how many isomers? Two compared to four for aldose. Here, four isomers compared to eight for aldoses. Here, eight compared to what? Sixteen of aldoses. Okay, again, here this picture only shows you what? D sugars with the highest chiral carbon with an OH point to where? To the right. Why we only show D? Because like we mentioned, D sugars are common in our what? Biologic system. We can only metabolize D monosaccharides. We can metabolize and use these D sugars. We cannot use L sugars. Good? Okay, that is, uh, I, I don't want to move too, too much today. So is it bad if we consume the L's, or, or does it just depend? On Depends. Most times it's not. Uh, they have the same property. For example, if a carbohydrate is sweet, the L sugar will be the same sweetness, but you cannot metabolize it at all. And because carbohydrates are a lot of hydroxy groups, carbohydrates are water soluble, so you can easily get it out from your urine. If it does not interact with something else, that one I'm not sure about L sugars. Most L sugars are used for that purpose as non-caloric sweeteners. What does it mean? It means you have the sweetness, but it does not provide what? Calorie. Why does it not provide a calorie? Because what? Because you don't even use them. So your body doesn't absorb it at all? Just yes, that's not. Because we, again, we cannot metabolize them. Okay, you, your body may absorb it, but, or may not. It depends. Right? It may still absorb it into a bloodstream, but your cell will not use them. Just excretes it from your kidney, from your urine. Because they're hydrophilic, they're water soluble. They will not accumulate in your body. And a lot of carbohydrates are used, L sugars are used for that purpose. All right, I'll, I'll stop here again, guys. Don't forget the bonus quiz for chapter 